questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello? Oh, hello. I'm ringing about the advertisement in yesterday's newspaper, the one for the bookcases. Can you tell me if they're still available? We've sold one, but we still have two available. Right. Um, can you tell me a bit about them? Sure. Um, what do you want to know? Well, I'm looking for something to fit in my study. So, well, I'm not too worried about the height, but the width's quite important. Can you tell me how wide each of them is? They're both exactly the same size. Let me see. I've got the details written down somewhere. Yes, so they're both 75 centimetres wide and 180 centimetres high. OK, fine. That should fit in OK. And I don't want anything that looks too severe. Not made of metal, for example. I was really looking for something made of wood. That's all right. They are, both of them. So are they both the same price as well? No, the first bookcase is quite a bit cheaper. It's just £15. We paid £60 for it just five years ago, so it's very good value. It's in perfectly good condition. Well, they're both in very good condition, in fact. But the first one isn't the same quality as the other one. It's a good sturdy bookcase. It used to be in my son's room, but it could do with... A fresh coat of paint. Oh, it's painted. Yes, it's cream at present. But as I say, you could easily change that if you wanted. To fit in with your colour scheme. Yes, I'd probably paint it white if I got it. Let's see, what else? How many shelves has it got? Six. Two of them are fixed, and the other four are adjustable, so you can shift them up and down according to the sizes of your books. Right, fine. Well, that certainly sounds like a possibility. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. But the second one's a lovely bookcase too. That's not painted, it's just the natural wood colour, dark brown. It was my grandmother's and I think she bought it sometime in the 1930s, so I'd say it must be getting on for 80 years old. So it's very good quality. They don't make them like that nowadays. And you said it's the same dimensions as the first one? Yes, and it's got the six shelves, but it also has a cupboard at the bottom that's really useful for keeping odds and ends in. Right. Oh, and I nearly forgot to say, the other thing about it is it's got glass doors, so the books are all kept out of the dust. So it's really good value for the money. I'm really sorry to be selling it, but we just don't have the room for it. Mm. So what are you asking for that one? £95. It's quite a bit more, but it's a lovely piece of furniture. A real heirloom. Yes. All the same, it's a lot more than I wanted to pay. I didn't really want to go above 30 or 40. Anyway, the first one sounds fine for what I need. Just as you like. So, is it all right if I come round and have a look this evening? Then, if it's OK, I can take it away with me. Of course. So, you'll be coming by car, will you? I've got a friend with a van, so I'll get him to bring me round. If you can just give me the details of where you live. Sure. I'm Mrs Blake. B-L-A-K-E. That's right. And the address is 41 Oak Rise. That's in Stanton. OK. So I'll be coming from the town centre. Can you give me an idea of where you are? Yes. You know the road that goes out towards the university? Yes. Well, you take that road and you go on till you get to a roundabout. Go straight on, then Oak Rise is the first road to the right. Out towards the university... Past the roundabout, first left. First right. And we're at the end of the road. Got it. So I'll be round at about seven, if that's all right. Oh, and my name's Connor. Connor Field. 
Fine. I'll see you then, Connor. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 17. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to tell you something about the Run Well charity and the work we do. I'll give a brief overview of what we do and I hope you may be able to help and then there'll be time for questions at the end. Runwell's founder, Mike Hughes, took up long-distance running in 1987, raising money by doing sponsored half-marathons, and in 1992 established the charity as we know it today. By 1997, the runs were being filmed by local TV, and today they appear on national TV every year. All the funds collected by Runwell go to the hospital with the idea that those fit enough to run use their energy to assist the provision of people who are unwell for whatever reason. Now, if you want to race, and I assume that's why many of you are here, let me explain a couple of the basics. Races are run by teams, so you need to form and register a team. What you wear to run in is up to you, and I know some teams come up with some pretty wacky ideas. We have a standard design for your numbers, which we ask you to reproduce. So you make them up according to that standard. We don't want to spend valuable funds on doing that ourselves. Now, the race is run as a kind of relay, so while you won't actually compete side by side, we do recommend that you train as a group. This helps to optimise performance and build team spirit. It will also give you a fair idea of how much you need to eat and drink over the race distance. This is clearly essential for an effective performance, so please make sure you come along to the race with sufficient food and drink. Again, we don't spend money on providing that, but you do need to keep yourself going for the 20 kilometer course. The course goes through the town, then out through Highfield Park, concluding in the main square, where the applauding spectators will be ready to greet you. There are many different prizes, including oldest runner, youngest runner, team with the most sponsorship, team with the best costume. That one's donated by Zoom Fashions. The mayor will introduce the Minister for Health, who will hand over each prize to the winners, and then the hospital president will make a short speech. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. OK, that's the big race. But I know there are many people who don't feel they are up to running a 20-kilometre race, but who would nevertheless like to raise money for Run Well. Over the years, we've had experience of many ways of trying to collect money, some very successful, others less so. Now, of course, 20 kilometres is too far for children to run. But there was a sponsored swimming event at the local school last year, and that did very well. People have also tried to organise food-based events, such as selling homemade cakes and bread and so on at the market. And there was a large picnic arranged in four bright gardens, although these events failed to justify the efforts put into them, though I'm sure they were very tasty. These days, so many people are out at work all day that going from house to house to collect money isn't very effective but it is possible to raise useful funds by selling small promotional items, such as badges with the Run Well motif on them. We're currently checking to see if postcards, perhaps showing the race's winners each year, might also be a good idea or not. We do appreciate the efforts that have gone into selling second-hand goods, 
but to be honest, the returns have not been very high on this. One very dedicated group organised a team quiz recently, which went very well, and it would be good to see more such activities. There's also been talk of a concert, but we'll have to see how plans for that progress. Now, are there any questions at this stage? Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Welcome to Orientation Week. Today I am here with the captain of our school's women's gymnastics team. Her name is Elizabeth Rain, and she is a fourth-year student. I hope you can all see her as an example of a responsible student and athlete, a role model for everyone. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for stopping by our Orientation Week. Thank you for having me. Welcome to our university, everyone. If there are any of you thinking about joining our school's athletic program, I would strongly encourage you to do it. Being a part of the gymnastics team has been one of my best experiences during my time at this school. It has taught me so much about teamwork and friendship, and has even taught me how to improve my academics by prioritizing my time. I have some questions that I am sure the students will want to know the answers to as well. First of all, how did you find the time to do well in classes as well as train for gymnastics? Prioritizing is the key. You must be very organized. Every day I wake up and I know what I must do for the day. I plan things in order of importance. For example, if today I have a competition for gymnastics in the afternoon, then I know I have to finish my homework and studying in the morning. In other words, keeping an organized schedule of your priorities is very important. Can you explain to the students a little bit about your study habits? Well, I usually try to take classes that I'm interested in. This way, I have no excuse not to study because I chose the classes out of my own preference. I separate my study time by class. For example, if I have five classes for this semester, I will study for one class a day from Monday through Friday and then review for all of them on the weekend. I won't try and study for all five of my classes at one time. It is too hard to do that, to remember everything and not feel like you are going crazy. It is very important to focus the time that you set aside for studying. I do not study with the television on. I try to keep away from all distractions because I find that I learn better that way. But of course, how each individual will study depends on each person. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. That sounds like good advice. Let's talk a little bit about your gymnastics career. How long have you been doing this sport for, and what has been the best moment of your college participation? Well, I've been participating in gymnastics since I was a kid. My parents got me involved in the sport. Hmm, the best moment. I would have to say that there is not one single instance that stands out in my mind as the best moment, but more of a whole experience. My first year in university was definitely one of the best years of my life. I met my best friends that year and really learned to grow up and be independent. Our team went to the national championships that year, and it was an incredible experience, so I would count the whole year as my best experience in college. How about the worst moment? It is true, everyone goes through bad experiences. My worst experience would have to be the fall of last year, when I broke my wrist. I was unable to participate in sports for the remainder of the year and had to learn how to write with my left hand. I guess when I look back at it, though, even though I wouldn't wish this to happen to anyone, this experience definitely made me stronger as a person. It taught me to look at life with a new perspective and to really value the friends and family that are important and close to me. Thanks for your time, Elizabeth. Do you have anything else you want to tell the new students? Just have a good time. Don't stress out too much, but be responsible for your actions. Work hard and play hard. That's my motto for life. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40.
Last week, we looked at some general principles associated with marketing, and today, I'd like to look at some of those points in a little more detail. So, what is marketing? Or put another way, what does the term marketing mean? Many people think of it simply as the process of selling and advertising, and this is hardly surprising when every day we are bombarded with television adverts, mail shots, and telephone sales. But selling and advertising are only two functions of marketing. In fact, marketing, more than any other business function, deals with customers. So perhaps the simplest definition is this one. Marketing is the delivery of customer value and satisfaction at a profit. In other words, finding customers, keeping those customers happy, and making money out of the process. The most basic concept underlying marketing is the concept of human needs. These include basic physical needs for things like food, as well as warmth and safety. And marketers don't invent these needs. They're a basic part of our human makeup. So, besides physical needs, there are also social needs. For instance, the need to belong and to be wanted. And in addition to social needs, we have the need for knowledge and self-expression, often referred to as individual needs. As societies evolve, members of that society start to see things not so much in terms of what they need, but in terms of what they want. And when people have enough money, these wants become demands. Now, it's important for the managers in a company to understand what their customers want if they're going to create effective marketing strategies. So there are various ways of doing this. One way at supermarkets, for instance, is to interview customers while they're doing their shopping. They can be asked about their buying preferences, and then the results of the survey can be analyzed. This provides reliable feedback on which to base future marketing strategies. It's also quite normal for top executives from department stores to spend a day or two each month visiting stores and mixing freely with the public, as if they were ordinary customers, to get an idea of customer behavior. Uh, another way to get information from customers is to give them something. For instance, some fast food outlets give away vouchers in magazines or on the street that entitle customers to get part of their meal for nothing, as well as being a good way of attracting customers into the restaurants to spend their money. It also allows the managers to get a feel for where to advertise and which age groups to target. Another strategy employed at some well-known theme parks, such as Disneyland, is for top managers to spend at least one day in their career touring the park dressed as Mickey Mouse or some other cartoon character. This provides them with the perfect opportunity to survey the scene and watch the customers without being noticed. Okay, well, we mentioned customer satisfaction at the beginning of this lecture, and I'd like to return briefly to that as it relates to what we've just been talking about. If the performance of a product falls short of the customer's expectations, the buyer is going to be dissatisfied. In other words, if the product you buy isn't as good as you'd expected, then the chances are you'll be unhappy about it. If, on the other hand, performance matches expectations and the product you buy is as good as you expected, then generally speaking, the buyer is satisfied. But smart companies should aim one step higher. They should aim to delight customers by promising only what they can be sure of delivering and then delivering much more than they promised. So then, if, as sometimes happens, performance is better than expected, the buyer is delighted and is twice as likely to come back to the store. Now, let's move on to look at the role of advertising.